Hello and welcome back to our Shift Remote Conference, a conference where we bring together the brightest developers online for you, our incredible audience. If you haven't joined us before, then welcome. If you've been with us the whole time, then welcome back. This is part five in our 12-part conference. Can't believe it that we're already on part five. This has been an incredible journey so far. I'll be your host for this conference, which means that I'll be popping up every now and then to introduce the next in our incredible lineup of speakers that we have prepared for you today. A little bit about how this is going to work. So we have about two and a half hours together. In an hour and a half's time, we're going to take a five minute break, which will be your chance to grab yourself a coffee, get some fresh air and then get yourself back here to be stuck in for the rest of our journey. Now, we always like using social media. Our hashtag for this is Shift Remote. If you want to take a photo, let us know how you're doing. But also, please do stay engaged. We have a chat section there on the right. Give us a thumbs up if you can see that chat section. Use that emoji. Put some smiley faces in there. Let's pretend we're in a room together because this will be exciting. We also have a comment section below, which we can use to ask any direct questions to our team who will pick them up and we can try and get them through to the speakers where there might be time for a Q&A. However, moving into beginning our conference, I just want to pick up a thank you to our incredible supporters and sponsors, without whom none of this would have been possible. So a thank you to the team at Microsoft, Infobip, Autodesk, Microblink, Barrage, Azure Idea, ICT, Japania, Venture, Pseudocode 5, Ars Futura, Nanobit, Infinuum, Q, Nine Dots, Get By Bus, Aspira, Code Anywhere, Pluggy, and Netokraja. Without you, none of this would be possible. With that out the way and the logistics all done, let's introduce the man who made this possible, Ivan Burazin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode five of the Shift Remote Developer Conference. Uh, this is episode five in the series of 12. Today, we will be talking about mobile and mobile development. A bit of name dropping of the speakers here, Disney and Spotify are among the great list of speakers that you will hear from in the next couple of hours. Uh, so please do keep focused, listen to them and ask questions. We had some great interactions last time and I hope we'll be having them this time as well. Uh, also, uh, this is the last event before our short summer break. Uh, we'll be back in about two weeks with two more events. Uh, then in about a month and a half, uh, Shift Developer Open Air Conference in Split Croatia. Make sure to get your tickets either virtual or in person. In any case, I hope you're enjoying the summer. I hope you enjoying the event and see you soon. Thank you, Ivan. I mean, who's excited, right? Isn't this great? We're all here together in this virtual space for yet another brilliant lineup of people. So let's move into our conference then. Our first speaker is a developer relations professional and an all-round engineer. Uh, they've worked with many web and mobile technologies in their career across the world for multiple companies. And they really look at how to be a productive engineer and help and mentor young students and professionals with their startups and mobile strategies. When they're not coding or speaking to developers, if they have the time, they try and play sports and video games. Let's welcome Aman Alam. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the talk. My name is Aman. Uh, a bit about myself, I live in Toronto. I have been working as a mobile app developer uh, in India and in Toronto for more than 10 years now. And I also have been a developer relations professional for many different companies throughout these years. And as a developer relations professional, I, in my different capacities, would go to different uh, people, developers, companies, and tell them about the products that my company uh, builds. These products were sometimes APIs, sometimes mobile SDKs, and this is how I got a lot of visibility on how so many different companies were building their mobile uh, app development uh, units and how some people did it right, how some people did not do it right. 
What I mean to say when I say mobile app dev business unit is either you are a smaller company or you're a, a big uh, enterprise, you will uh, end up deciding someday that, okay, you want a mobile app and you want a team responsible for building that mobile app. So for the purpose of this whole presentation, I will call that team uh, a business unit, regardless of how big of a company you are. Okay, so we are going to talk about some best practices and tips that I've seen in my career, which uh, make or break teams and products. Okay, so this is needless to say, but uh, it's important to reiterate that the mobile apps or the whole mobile app landscape is a very serious and valuable terminal now. Uh, when I say terminal, I mean a place where you can collect or distribute information from. You can consider this as a thick client, uh, an extension of your website, etc., but with more capabilities than a web browser. So if you just look at the statistics, uh, with the growth in uh, high-speed internet and uh, betterment in the technologies that power mobile phones, a lot of tra internet traffic now comes from mobile devices. If you just look at the video streaming services that I've been picking up lately, more than 50% of their traffic came from mobile devices. When you say mobile devices, they're not just mobile phones, but also tablets. Uh, if you look at just US, the mobile consumers spend 90% of their time spent on mobile in apps. So instead of using a web browser, most of the people are using uh, mobile apps. So if you are plan to have mobile apps, you, your gut feeling is totally right. The internet traffic, if you compare uh, from 2011 to 2019, the internet traffic that came from mobile saw an increase of 500%. And if you take the example of revenue, just in 2019, Cyber Monday, 54% people visited different uh, retailers' websites using a mobile device, and 33% sales actually happened from a mobile device. Uh, I, I have all the uh, citations available. When the uh, presentation goes out to you, you will have the source of these statistics. If not, you can always contact me. I'll give it to you. So a mobile app or a mobile device is not just uh, a like a toy or a child's play anymore it's a very serious device that all of us carry with ourselves all the time it has lots of sensors it uh, can tell us a lot more about the people uh, and the users and their situations and it gives us a lot more chances to deliver custom and more personalized experiences for example if you are uh, an app which tries to like, be a health app, your mobile app can tell you when the, your user is started to walk or has started to drive in a car or has started to uh, bike. So these three activities you can tell uh, uh, in, inside a mobile app. We now ultimately are going to have a teenage generation which was born with mobile phones. So there are still like small kids and toddlers who can handle mobile apps and mobile phones very easily. But ultimately, uh, in 2021, we'll have a full generation of teenagers which were born uh, and they have always seen a mobile app or mobile, mobile devices. So we are entering an era where for a lot of people, mobile phone is their first computer and their first connection to internet. So this uh, terminal, this, uh, this portal to the users definitely cannot be ignored. So yes, you cannot ignore it. Now you want to have a mobile app. And you obviously want to be a successful uh, mobile app business. So what do you do? Let's talk about how the whole journey looks like when you're trying to build a mobile app business unit or mobile app dev uh, team. Uh, I talk about this funnel uh, in a very generalized and a very high level view manner. There can always be nuances, but for simplicity's sake, let's look at this. You will probably go from idea or planning phase about the concept that you're trying to build an app for. Once you have finalized those ideas or concept and have a plan in place, 
you're going to hire and make a team of developers. And then what these developers are going to build and deliver your product. And once the product is live and delivered to your customers, your users, your team is also responsible for supporting, debugging, and improving the application. Depending on whether you are uh, an agency or whether you are a product company, your delivery and improvement cycles may look diff slightly different, but more or less it's the same. Uh, in services company, your services agencies, your goal is to uh, close down a project as soon as possible. And then if your client gives you a maintenance contract, then you support debug and improve their applications. And in a product company, that the support and improvement part is a lot more crucial and a lot more uh, nuanced. Let's quickly look at the first part where your idea, concept, and planning comes to the picture. And uh, forgive me for my terrible color choices. Uh, I don't think I can do better. So you, when you plan, there are a few things that you should be keeping in mind. First of them is what geographies you're going to target. The world works in different ways in different regions. And according to me, the best is to start with a geography where which you understand the best so if you are a north american company and you understand north american consumer mindset the best you should start there first and then try to go 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 global uh there are some apps which are very contextualized to a region so they are never going to go global for example uh, an app which is uh, going to give you information about uh, a tourist places in a certain city or in a certain country. So that app will work only in that country, in that country and you don't need to uh, worry about it being a global app. But imagine you're building something which lets you uh, talk to people or uh, do a dating kind of a service around the world. So in, in those scenarios, I personally feel that you should start with a geography that you understand the best and then slowly move forward. Why that's important is depending on what geographies you choose, the kind of devices that are available, they will vary. The, uh, the app size that the populations of those different areas are accustomed to, they will vary. How the data consumption behavior is of the population and how people buy, that will vary. For example, uh, if you consider North America versus Asia, uh, North American uh, markets have very few uh, Chinese uh, uh, OEMs or device manufacturers, while in Asia, uh, this story is uh, completely reversed. And why I particularly mention Chinese is because when you talk about Chinese uh, devices, uh, the, the manufacturers such as Xiaomi, Redmi, uh, Oppo, Gioni, they use a very different kind of uh, terminology. Uh, and different philosophy for building their devices. Uh, the devices have a very strong uh, battery saver or data saver service running on uh, on the device all the time. Uh, sometimes there are some nuances in the behaviors only specific to these uh, ROMs. And I'm talking about Android apps uh, on Android. Uh, on iOS, uh, this is more or less uh, the same around the world. So sometimes you would want to build an app where if you're going to run uh, those apps in Asian markets, you need to target specific uh, these devices. And you have to make sure that, let's say, notifications in your app are going to work well. Because sometimes in, in on those devices, because of a very strict battery saver policies that the app itself follows, your apps are going to get killed in the background very often. And if your app depends on notifications, your app is not going to receive too many notifications. So for example, a recent uh, case study with Signal, the uh, messaging app. On Signal FAQ page, uh, you have a whole list of, how, of FAQ on how to solve the notification not arriving problem. And in, in, uh, on that page, they have listed different devices and how to solve the notification issues on those devices. So if you're going global, you will end up facing those kinds of uh, problems too. Certain geographies don't allow your app to be distributed from 
uh, the uh, the typical distribution channels such as Play Store uh, and App Store. They have their own uh, App Store and their own uh, app distribution channels. So you might have to uh, tailor and cater your uh, app for those uh, distribution channels. Some uh, populations are very app size uh, sensitive. For example, in Asia, throughout the years, this, uh, this limit has increased. But we have found out that if your app is more than 12 MB or 15 MB in size, the people in uh, emerging economies, they are less likely to download your app. The bigger your app size is, the less likely they are to download. The reason for that have been because, first of all, traditionally, this uh, market, these markets are price sensitive, so they buy cheaper phones. That means they'll have lesser memory available on uh, the device, and they'll also not be affording, probably not be affording, uh, a lot of data on their data plan. So downloading a big app also consumes their data, and it also makes them have a choice which app should de I delete because most of the times their app, their mobile app, mobile devices are completely filled, right? So these choices have to be made. On other uh, side of the world in developed country countries, uh, that is different. You have widespread Wi-Fi coverage, so people uh, tend to care less about the app size. The devices that are being bought in the developed world, they have better configuration, so that's a less of uh, a worry there. Similarly, buying behavior also affects because uh, in developed country, you can assume that a lot of people would be uh, educated to understand how uh, buying online works. When I say educated, I don't mean literate. I mean education around online buying behavior. A lot of people in developed countries are already uh, accustomed to buying through their cards. You can assume they'll have a credit card, while on the developing side of the world, uh, that is still evolving. If you're going into uh, place, many places in Africa, the smartphone penetration is still very less. So you might need to build a mobile app service depending on the SMS. You may not be able to build a smartphone app at all. So this, these are some nuances that you have to look around for when you are trying to plan on what geographies you're going to serve. Uh, and, and, and a useful site is App Annie, where you can go and look for these stats. Uh, they are used in past. They, I think they have some free and paid plans too, so you can explore them. Next comes a decision. Do you want a native app or a cross-compiled app? When I say cross-compiled, I mean apps that are made in React Native or Flutter, etc. And then on the other end, there are native apps. So in my experience, uh, like, which has changed very recently, is a lot of times your apps are not going to do things which only native can do. So for example, on Android and iOS both, because these are the leading platforms, you have lots of sensors. You have GPS, camera, uh, thermometer, uh, light sensor, proximity sensor. And using these sensors, you can do a lot of things. You want to do probably character recognition. You want to do artificial uh, uh, augmented reality stuff. So for all of that, your native app development is your best bet. But if you're trying to build something which is, let's say, an e-commerce store where people see uh, a lot of products and they can buy those products, all your React Native and Flutter will work fine. So my personal uh, opinion now is for 80% or 70% of the apps, which are just take clients, where data comes from server and you just are uh, collecting and displaying data with the user very beautifully, your cross compilation will work. And if you think in future, you will have very serious uh, uh, character recognition, image recognition going on on the app, then probably native is your choice. Also, another thing that you can do is, let's say you are trying to build a new business unit and you are going to experiment whether this thing works or not. So then you can choose to build a, a serious prototype uh, in something like React Native, put it out in the market, see if the, there, there is traction, and once you see uh, there is there's attraction and 
I have a long roadmap of this app ahead. And in that roadmap, some way or the other, I am going to use a lot of native features. Then you uh, uh, you rewrite the whole app in a native uh, Android or native iOS. Why this uh, is an important decision to make is because this is going to affect how you hire and how you build your team. We'll talk about this uh, in next few slides. So uh, let's let's talk about that there. Then you will also need to decide if if your app is going to be long lived, like an Uber. Or is your app going to be ephemeral? Right? Let's say you are going to build something only for an event. Uh, and this app is just going to tell you about how many talks are there and where to go find uh, food trucks, etc. So depending on what you uh, want, if your app is going to be very long living or short term, you can choose whether to invest in native or cross compilation. Uh, when we talk about future, you, we need to understand that mobile apps are going to stay. They're, they're not going anywhere. And even though it, seem, it may seem that the cutting edge innovation in the phones has stopped, uh, the phones will continue to be sold. And there will be new terminals, new experiences, and new screens that will uh, start coming in. So when you're thinking about future, think about those screens coming in. For example, a smartwatch or a screen in your car. For example, if you're, uh, let's say, an insurance company which wants to build a mileage app so that you you're, you can uh, time and you can measure how your users are driving your car so that you can give them better rates, a lot of insurance companies have those apps on mobile uh, already. But with Android, uh, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay coming into picture, you might want to extend to those areas uh, for for this particular app, if you are a fitness app, it makes sense to have an extension on a watch. So these new terminal new experiences will continue emerging. We might somewhere uh, down the line see uh, a human and human brain and computer interaction coming into picture, uh, which may work with your mobile app. So this this whole part where computers are very small, always on, always connected to data, and are mobile with the uh, people, this is going to stay. OK, so next is uh, hiring and making a team. Uh, like we just talked about, the tech choices that you're going to make will affect your talent pool. There are career app developers who have just done app development and nothing else. So for example, Android and iOS came around 2007, 2008. So it's easily 12 years now since these uh, disciplines have been in, into picture. So when you're going out uh, trying to hire people, you may find Java Android developers who have only done uh, Android uh, with Java and nothing else. So it's, it will be unfair to, let's say, find a Java Spring Boot developer and ask them to build uh, Android apps because they may take time uh, to learn it and they may not be an expert in that. And you may not always have time to uh, have them ramp up. Similarly, if you also have an Android Java developer, it will be unfair to assume that they can automatically use Java and build something else. So just keep in mind that just because Android uses Java and uh, there is Java used for somebody else. That Java experience can be used everywhere else. Or let's say if React Native uses JavaScript and a web front end or a web browser also uses JavaScript, these skills are easily transferable. These are not easily transferable for most of the people. Yes, there are polyglots available which know the full length and breadth of uh, the language and can use it anywhere. Uh, but more often than not, there are people who are experts only in these certain fields. And when you're building a team, you would want to uh, ideally end, end up being with a project manager, an in-house designer, a couple of app developers for each of the platform, uh, a product manager, an engineering manager, a VP. But in my opinion, if you're starting out, you can start small. You can start without uh, a project manager or an in-house designer. You can start with somebody which has uh, a web backend experience who can build your APIs, somebody with 
let's say you're going for native, somebody with for native app development for Android and iOS, and if you're going for something like uh, React Native, somebody who knows React Native. You can start out with this, and when your team starts growing, you can fill up other people. Why I say that? Because mobile app developers uh, often work in conjunction with other teams heavily. So when it comes to designing, let's say, for example, it can rarely be the case where designers deliver something which a mobile app developer can immediately start to use. There are tools that are being uh, built to solve this, but this is still under, under, uh, under the making, under development. So on, on the web, what used to happen, your designers would give you HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and all the animations, and et cetera. You will just put that in your views folder and start saving things around, start putting some logics in it, and things will start working. On app side, your, desi your designers can only give you layouts. They can only give you font files. They can only give you assets. Putting them together in the app, exporting it from the tools, and putting it inside your code base, that's still a job for mobile app developers. Thankfully, now there are breed of designers who understand mobile very well, but otherwise, earlier on, you had to, as a mobile developer, you had to teach a lot to your designers on how to think about a small screen perspective. So your app developers are going to be uh, uh, multi-skilled in, in terms of how the app works, how the app design works, and they'll be working very closely with the backend team. So one of the things that I always uh, ask the teams to do is do not silo the app development and the API development teams. Have them talk to each other a lot, OK? And they can probably uh, work on an API spec together, and then they can work off of it. We'll talk about this uh, more uh, towards the later part of the slide. Then comes uh, the team that you have hired. It will build and deliver the product. So when you're building the team and the team is trying to build the app, you should understand that the DevOps side of things for app development can wait. You can have uh, a continuous integration or continuous deployment server, which builds everything remotely from a Git repo and generates a build, upload it somewhere. You can automate it. But this can wait. This, this is not supposed to be the first step that you will do, because the way apps are built, they, you or the, the mobile app developers will be able to create everything on the local machines. And you don't need an automated server unless you have uh, a very distributed and very big team. And you will reach there slowly. So until then, these things can wait. You can build them slowly in parallel. You should be using uh, a, a lot of healthy automated testing and code reviews practices if your team doesn't know it. You can give them time to learn it. It may feel uh, an overkill in the beginning, but it always has long-term benefits uh, to reduce the amount of bugs and uh, reduce the regressions that you can build out in future apps. Definitely do dog fooding. What I mean by dog fooding is use your own apps. If you are a part of a company and you're building an app, uh, have your uh, developers give frequent builds to everybody in the company and have everybody in the company use those apps and then give developers feedback. If you have anywhere from four to 4,000 employees, these people who are not building the app and are still using it, they are your best case scenario to collect feedback. So in on this dog pudding channel, you can have beta testers. They will only be uh, given access to the app that you're building. And you can deploy, let's say, every week or whenever a new feature is having some serious you know, development going on, you can keep giving it to people and ask them for feedback. This is one of the sure, short way to not ship the app with bugs. OK? Uh, again, as I talked about, the API and app team should be working very closely uh, so that there is no race condition. The, uh, uh, the timelines also will work out because if the teams are talking very regularly, there will be no situations or very little situations where the app team will say, oh, I am ready, but the API team is not. Or the API would say, oh, the APIs were delivered, but if the product is not out, it's app team's fault. So one of the ways to do it is if you're building, let's say, an API, and the app uses the API, you can, instead of waiting for the whole API to be built, 
you can use something like a Swagger or Open API specification, put it on a mock server, and then the app can uh, keep accessing that mock server as if it was a real API. And the API team can keep building business logic on the back end, conforming to this API specification. So the API specification where your teams spend the most time on before coding their respective back end and front end, they agree on what the API specification is going to be, and then they build against each other, like against this API spec. The API team will build the API so that the output and input that uh, the APIs actually deliver conforms to the API spec, and the app team will continue to access this API spec on a mock server as if it was a real API. So when the API is ready, all you have to do is remove this mock server, to start having the app access the real API, and then do integration testing. So both of the teams this way can work in parallel, save time, and still agree on what they're going to build and meet at uh, a same road, okay? You, uh, you have lots of analytics uh, reporting platforms around. I suggest use them early. Uh, this decision on user analytics on what needs to be captured usually comes from the product team or whoever uh, did the ideation. Start uh, getting that decision in writing quickly and start using those integrations early on. Because if you wait for till the end, then these decisions generally decisions generally tend to be made in a rush and they're not the right decisions. Okay. Uh, for tools, uh, this is a this is a non-exhaustive list of tools available. Uh, if you want to build API or on a on a backend as a service system, you have Firebase available where you don't need to code an API backend server. Firebase SDKs can do a lot of it for user analytics, crash reporting, performance monitoring. How you in the web world, performance monitoring is called real time user uh, monitoring or RUM. So these tools will let you understand how your app is performing on different devices. So that you can use these SDKs and keep a check on when your app goes out, how it's performing, if there are areas that needs to be improved. If your app is taking too long to do a network operation, you can use any of these network analysis tools to see where things are going wrong, if packets are being dropped, et cetera. And let's say if you want to test your app on different devices, but you don't have them, you can use things like Firebase Test Lab or AWS Device Farm to deploy your app on real devices uh, on the cloud and see how they're working on your browser. So these tools uh, can be helpful, but again, these will be a starting point. There will be a lot more tools available. When you're building APIs or you're doing uh, app development, try to stick to standards as much as possible. If you're building a REST API, try to stick to REST standards because if you're sticking to standards, no matter how remote or how cohesive your team is, everybody will be on the same page. If you are using, uh, if you're trying to use automated testing, use the uh, officially supported tools available on your platform. If you are trying to load some images, uh, do some uh, all online or offline storage, if you're trying to make uh, network calls, use the standard libraries that are uh, out there for your platform. There are a couple of uh, benefits for doing that because you'll not be reinventing the wheel. If this library is out there and a lot of people already use it, there are chances that there are a lot of bugs that have already been fixed, which if you are making your own thing, you will be making those bugs again. In some companies, the idea is to not use open source stuff because uh, these open source stuff may have security implications, so they generally pick it up, put their own uh, security layer and security uh, scrutiny around it, and then uh, deploy it. That's a call for if you if your company has a security policy around around that. That's a call that you should make. But according to me, uh, all these libraries out there, there have been very few incidents where these libraries have caused uh, any open source libraries have caused security uh, issues. So don't re reinvent the wheel. Use these popular libraries. It'll save you time, save you effort, and it'll ease your development. When it comes to handling faults and error, always handle them graciously. If you, if you can catch anything, always catch it. And always use an else to an if. This is more like a coding tip, but uh, I also learned a few years ago that 
sometimes if you just have an if and for some reasons that if is not triggered on your app sometimes nothing will happen and you'll, you will never figure out why so try to always have an else to an if even if you're just doing plain logging and log as much as possible once uh, the problem with app development is once your app goes out to people's phones it's out of your hands right if you have shipped a bug it's on people's will to update your app and get rid of the bug and where what i've seen in one of the research that one of my friends did uh, at least in uh, the eastern uh, side of the world only 60 percent of your user bases update your uh, the app in the first 15 days the rest 40 percent can take up to two months to update your app so let's say you uh, fix, shipped a bug and you now have a, a patch which you just shipped out your patch may not be downloaded from uh, by a lot of people so a lot of people continue to might continue to just keep facing that bug so be very uh, judicious about what you're shipping test heavily uh, catch whatever can be caught even if so that even if you're failing the app is not crashing it is at least displaying uh, graceful uh, error methods error, error messages and log a lot so that because when you start receiving these crash reports you will not understand how the user got there to cause this crash so if you're logging it will give you kind of breadcrumbs to understand how the user journey happened and how to uh, recreate this journey in order to recreate this crash or recreate this error so that you can uh, solve this so use use these things now when it comes to support and debugging you can use these tips that we just talked about uh, to continuously keep getting data from back from users and feeding it to product pipeline to see how you want to improve it so you will keep profiling your code you will keep uh, uh, getting uh, receiving the reports from the real world to see how your app is performing and then depending on uh, what you want to achieve you will make adjustment so i i like to suggest people that you should have a goal but the goal can be something like i want to have 99 percent crash free users this is a very utopian idealistic scenario let's say uh, in real world, you want to have 95% crash-free users. If the rate drops, you have to investigate what's happening. So you can have those goals in place. You can put a TV uh, and put your crash reporting and analytics on the TV so that you have that number in front of you all the time. You can set up alerts, okay? Uh, or you can just say, we want to have 40% people buying from mobile app. Uh, this is a tricky one, but let's say if you put a goal like that and you see the numbers are dropping, that's a good indicator of for you for you to go figure out if there is any problem on the app where people are not able to make a buying decision. So you may find out, okay, the app is completely fine. It's just that the people are just not interested. It's holiday season, people are relaxing, that's fine. But at least if you get a signal that the, the sales coming from mobile is dropping, it's a good signal to investigate. What if there was something where the card pages are not loading at all, and that's why people are not able to buy. So at least if you have these goals, they will trigger you to go investigate. So have those goals and then iterate. Uh, like we talked about, the bugs on mobile app and web app, they're slightly different. On web app, if you make any mistake, if you ship a bug, all you have to do is ship a patch, and next time when the user refreshes their page, your bug will be fixed, right? But on mobile apps, the bug lives with the user. And if they don't update your app, the bug is going to be with them. So be very cautious about what kind of things that you're going to ship, test a lot, and try to have uh, a, a, a pipeline where you're dog fooding, you're beta testing, and then your QA make sure that the app is not reducing a lot of bugs, okay? And one of the things is, when you try to write uh, release notes, be a little more creative. Uh, that's a chance for you to entice your users. Just saying bug fixes are important. Okay, uh, we are just uh, towards the end. Uh, yeah, so you can use uh, better release notes. That's a, that's a good chance for you to be creative there uh, and uh, entice your audience. This is one thing that very few people do, but I think it should be done more your end users if they are more visible to your uh, developers who are building the app the developers know more about what 
they are their apps are going to be used in so try to include your users your developers in user researches or customer calls user interviews of course if the developers want to even if they do it let's say twice a year it will give a go it will give them a good window to understand what happens with their apps in the real world and if they need to change some perspective that will be it from uh, from my side sorry for going a little over time but if you have any more questions uh, feel free to reach out to me on twitter with my handle or there are other ways to contact me there on my website i hope this this was helpful for you and um, thank you thank you aman now let us know what you thought there in that chat uh, any questions, any comments, any thoughts or feelings? I love it. Let's just keep talking. Um, our next speaker, though, moving on with our conference, is a passionate and curious iOS developer, author and speaker, currently working at the Disney streaming services on an SDK that powers Disney+. Plus. They've written three books on iOS development and delivered talks and workshops all over the world. When they aren't doing this, and if they even have the time, they love spending time with their cat and enjoy hanging out, playing around on a guitar. Let's welcome Donnie Walls. All right. So hello, everybody. Good to have you here. Um, good to be here. My name is Donnie Walls. Um, I am an iOS engineer at Disney Streaming Services. Uh, in my spare time, I like to write on my website, donniewalls.com. Uh, I have a book called Practical Combine. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that would be at Donny Walls. Um, and today I would like to talk to you about something that I have been doing for the past few years uh, as a member of the SDK team at Disney. Uh, because at Disney, we have an SDK that powers uh, a lot of our applications and it powers Disney Plus amongst others. And it mostly provides networking capabilities and also a bunch of other features. I can imagine that we have apps for multiple platforms. And when you have your SDK at the core of iPhone apps and web applications, Android applications, gaming consoles, and, and more, um, you can imagine that you're going to run into a lot of differences between these platforms and between their needs and between their capabilities. So we opted and we decided that we would need to have not just one centralized SDK that would run on every platform, um, that we would need to write something far more tailored for every specific platform to make sure that we can use and utilize every platform to its maximum extent. Now, there are a couple of risks when you do this, because while you gain the possibility to tap into every platform's maximum potential, you also run the risk of having every platform do things slightly differently. And you can imagine that if you have an SDK that provides a lot of networking capabilities and does a lot of the talking to the back end, that you want to make sure that this SDK that you're shipping works the same on every platform. And to do that, what you have to make sure of is that your engineers are able to communicate efficiently and effectively. And in this talk, I will go deeper into the steps that you can take and that we also take to ensure that we communicate as good as possible and that every feature is implemented consistently. Um, so you can also adopt this into your own workflows. Even if you don't work on apps that run on a lot of devices, even if you're only working on something that's iPhone and Android or iPhone, Android and web. So by the end of this talk, you should be able to improve your own processes and also enhance your code quality. And at the heart of the process of, of doing this, at the heart of the process of building an SDK that works on a lot of platforms with different teams working on each, each flavor of the SDK, uh, at the heart of that lies feature specs. So let's jump right in and, and take a look at these feature specs and what should be in them. 
Now a feature spec or spec is written to capture the requirements of a feature or a component at a level that allows developers to implement the feature. Now, that means that a spec has to be detailed, it has to be correct, and most importantly, it has to be up to date. I'll talk more about the process of making sure it's up to date and that it's detailed and correct, but let's take a look at what should be in the spec first before we figure out how to put everything in there correctly. Now, a good spec will, at the very least, capture what a feature is and how it should work. Each platform is going to build its own native implementation, so that means that you don't have to go into the exact details of how everything should be done as long as you capture the business rules and the core of it. Now, a good spec will, therefore, also describe the public interface. Now, the private stuff, again, is not that important. What's important is how users of your framework or your SDK are going to interface with it uh, through the public interface, because you want to make sure that every platform's public interface is more or less the same uh, as long as the platform allows it. Now, that means that you're going to describe what something does. So if, if the outcome of a certain call to the public interface would mean that you're going to make a network call, you don't want to write down which framework should be used for that. Instead, you're going to write down how a request is formatted or which parameters have to be there or how a certain response should be cached and not necessarily where exactly that would happen because that is an implementation detail for every platform. And you're only trying to make sure that every platform works the same. Now, in addition to explaining how something or, or what should be done and a little bit of the how through the public interface and business rules, you're also going to want to write down the why. And it's not so much because developers need to be convinced to implement the spec correctly. It means that you want to have a little bit of information of why something needs to be done a certain way. For example, if a network request has to be formatted in a very specific manner, it's good to link to some documentation that explains how that should be done and also a little bit of the documentation for why, just so you have the context and understand the constraints that you're operating within. And lastly, even though you're not going to write code or define everything, you, you would write a little bit of UML for the public API, um, mostly so that other developers who are going to implement the spec that you are writing uh, can see what they should do and how they should do it, and also to get a feeling for where something fits in the bigger picture of an entire framework. Uh, so let's go in and look at an example of a spec, right? Like how detailed should it be and uh, what's in there and then how is that written? So what I have here is, is a very brief introduction of a user login flow. What you can see here is that you don't have to read it all. It's, it's just a bunch of words. Um, but what I described first is the happy path, right? So what is going to be the most common use case? What's going to be the use case that most people will encounter? And after that, you start writing your failures and your exceptions a little bit to make sure that you also cover the unhappy paths and make sure that you uh, provide some guidance as to what should happen if everything doesn't go to plan. Now, what you want to do is keep these descriptions brief. Right? You don't want to write a whole book. Uh, you don't want to sell the feature. You just want to make sure that everybody has just enough information to implement the feature. I also mentioned that you should have a little bit of UML in there. Now, the UML that I'm showing here on screen is, is very basic. It's very minimal. It just defines a brief public API. It, it notes some errors, and it also describes an interface. So instead of describing a class or a struct or any other kind of concrete object, everything is described through interfaces, and that's mostly to cement this idea that every platform can implement this as they see fit and as fits best on their platform, as long as something works the way that's described in this UML. And of course, also, like I said, make sure to add sources and documentation to provide that little bit of context when needed. And while with these three simple ingredients, some text, some UML, 
and some links, you should be able to get pretty far with your implementation, but it's not always obvious when something is missing in a spec. Like you can read it a couple of times and sometimes it's obvious that certain errors are not being handled or that something is overlooked completely. But when there are edge cases missing, it can be really hard to figure out what's missing while reading the spec for the first time. Uh, it usually happens to me that I only figure out what's missing when I'm implementing something or when I ship something and something happens in production that I didn't anticipate. And for that reason, and for many other reasons, I love writing tests. So would there be any way that we can take this love of mine of testing uh, and also take a spec and then apply tests to this spec? Right? Even though the spec are, is just words and not implementation code that you can run, there is a way that you can write some tests. And uh, it, it's almost a little bit of a language framework that I love to use for that is Gherkin. Um, Gherkin is, is a human readable uh, pseudo language that you can use to define behavioral tests. So what's in Gherkin? Amongst many other things, I found three building blocks to be essential. The first of those is the given. And with a given, you describe the state of your application or the state of the environment before a test runs. Uh, so for example, it could be given a valid user token or given uh, the input from a form field. The second building block is when, and in the when you describe an action, you describe the thing that you want to test, right? So you could say given an, a user token, when using this token to sign in, then something else should happen, which happens to be the third building block. Now, two things that are important about, or all of them really uh, a note about them is that don't do too much, right? Because the given only describes the preconditions of your environment. If you have more than one precondition, you can write that down. But if you start writing down four or five or six preconditions, it's very likely that your test is becoming too big or that your feature is not isolated enough to be properly tested. And often you can break it up into several smaller tests with fewer preconditions. In the when you describe the action, I already mentioned that, but you want to test one action. So you don't want to test that a user does thing A, then they do thing B, and then they do thing C. Those should be three separate tests uh, with different givens, uh, depending on the outcome of every action on their own. So you only want to test one action. In very, very strange cases or uh, with, ex with certain exceptions, you might have two actions, but typically you're going to have one action. And third, you're going to want to write down a then. And the then is your assertion. It's making sure that the environment is now in the state that you expect. And you can have several of these, but it can make sense that after you re refresh a user's access token, that this token is persisted to a database, but also communicated back to the caller of the refresh token method. That makes perfect sense. And it's okay to have a couple of them. Again, uh, once you start running into the five, six, or seven then cases, you're probably doing too much. So even though these three things are really simple, your Gherkin tests can really help you to understand a feature, right? Because when you read these Gherkin tests, you can get a feeling for, oh, okay, so when I do this, that should happen. And when I do this, then that should happen. And because every test should be very small and human readable, you can go through a whole bunch of tests pretty quickly and get a really good sense of what a feature should do. And while you're implementing a feature, a Gherkin test will help you realize when the feature is fully implemented. Uh, one of my frustrations when working from a spec is that it's not possible to look into the head of the person that wrote this spec for me. So I have to sort of guess when I'm finished implementing a feature, right? When is it done? And if that person also provides a set of tests and they can say like, if these tests pass, I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that the feature is completely implemented and all the use cases are covered. And 
also they help you discover edge cases. Like I mentioned earlier that it's really hard to see what's missing from a spec if you're just reading the text. It's much easier to figure out any edge cases that are missing from a Gherkin test. For example, if you see a test where you want to make a network call and that network call requires authentication and somebody wrote down the Gherkin test when making a network call with a valid authentication token, it's pretty easy to ask yourself the question, okay, then what should happen if I make the same request with an invalid access token? Or what happens if I make that request without a token at all? Right, so that's two cases that you can tack on there pretty quickly simply by asking the opposite of what's described in a Gherkin test. And I found that this really helps improve the quality of your spec and also that it helps improve the quality of your test suite in your, in your application or in your framework. And it also helps improve the quality of your, your final product because you have a much better idea of what you're implementing. Now let's look at an example of, of a Gherkin test. So let's start very simple. Given a valid username and password, when, these, when using these credentials to call the login service, then a valid token should be stored because we want to persist that locally apparently, and the valid token should be surfaced to the caller of the login method. Now, if you read this, you understand what should happen when you provide a username and password that's going to be accepted by the server. Now, if you see this, it's also easy to ask the opposite. What if I have an invalid username and or password? So let's add some more tests. We're going to take valid again and use the credentials, but we thought it was valid, turns out it's not. So now the credentials error returned by the service should be surfaced to the caller of the login method. So this means that we can see that when something's wrong, the server will tell us about it, and we have to send this to the caller of our function. Let's add some more. Given the username and password, I'm using credentials to call the login service. I duplicated that slide, I'm very sorry about that. Given an empty username and an empty password, when using these credentials to call the login service, then the credentials error should be serviced to the caller of the login method. So in the previous test, we saw that we did send the data, but that data wasn't valid. And now what we see is that if we send an empty username and an empty password, we can send that to our service and the service will give us an error back. And what we can learn from that is that apparently we don't really have to do any client-side validation, but we can send an empty username and an empty password to the service and the service will respond with something. So any client-side validation that you would add here is completely optional and should mimic what the server normally does, but it's not a necessity. It's, it's completely something that's up to the platform teams themselves uh, because again, we only describe what should happen. We don't describe how it should happen. Now let's see what happens with a slightly different combination of an empty username and a non-empty password. Okay, so that does the same. Given an empty username and non-empty password, using these credentials to call the login service, the credentials error returned by the service should be served to the caller of the login method. Great, right? This tells us a lot. Again, we don't have to do any validation. It tells us that somebody thought about this case and it tells us what to do. Now, once you have a whole bunch of these and you think everything is covered and the spec is finished, you submit this spec for review, right? Because up until this point, even though you're working with several teams, there's only one or two people working on this spec, right? So at some point it's time to share your spec and submit it for a review. Now you do this just through a simple GitHub pull request, or if you use anything else uh, in your teams, then of course use that uh, review mechanism. What do you focus on during this review phase? Well, first of all, you want to make sure that the spec is clear. You're going to start with reading the text, seeing if you understand everything, see if there's no ambiguities in there, see if there's no contradictions in there. Just make sure that it's a high quality, well-written piece of text. You're also going to test links to the documentation and compare them to the written spec. 
Uh, I have seen more than one example where somebody would add a link to documentation, but in the meantime, that documentation changed or the documentation moved to a new location or whatever, and somebody forgot to communicate that and you have a dead link in your spec. Um, and in the pull request phase, you of course want to do everything to avoid any dead ends in terms of documentation. Now you're also going to check the UML for correctness because you want to make sure that everything that's in the UML can be implemented on your platform. You want to make sure that it all fits. You want to make sure that things don't end up in weird places or that things are defined in strange ways. Um, I mentioned that you have to check if something is possible for your platform or that it fits in your platform. Um, if you're writing native code for every single uh, language or every single platform that you serve, it can definitely happen that certain platforms don't have the capabilities that other platforms may or may not have. Um, when that happens, it's good to call it out in the spec, make a little note of it uh, in the UML or in the text for the spec or really anywhere where you just say like, hey, the JavaScript team is going to diverge a little bit from the spec because it doesn't make sense for them to do so and so, or they don't have like type safety like Swift and Kotlin do. So maybe, you know, they they can relax their constraints a little bit because they work very different. And of course, you also aside from your language features, just make sure that it's completely possible on your platform. And validate the tests, read them, think them through, make sure that they're complete, make sure that everything is there. And then lastly, make sure that at least one member from each platform team approves the spec, just so you have that little check from every platform that everything is good, everything's possible, and everybody saw it, so there's no surprises for any team. Now, once you have your spec review done, everybody's going to implement uh, your spec. Now, what's going to happen is you'll find that every team is going to want to work on something at a roughly different time. Uh, there are many reasons for this. One reason could be that team A has a bug fix to ship and team B does not have that same problem so they can start on a feature sooner. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to try and force everybody to work on the same feature at the same time, um, simply because you know things happen and everybody's going to be waiting for everybody and you won't get anything done. So you're going to have to accept that even though you have your spec, everybody is going to implement stuff at a slightly different rate. Your versioning within Teams is also not going to be identical. Um, we found that, for example, the Apple platforms SDK had to bump their major version a bunch of times for Swift version updates or for breaking changes in other places where other teams did not have to do this. Um, you could major bump every SDK if one has the major bump, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter much as long as everybody knows which version of the spec they're on. And you're going to want to make sure that every team can work at their own pace. This sort of goes back to that first point that I made that everything will happen at slightly different paces for every team and you should embrace that and not try to make everybody work on the same thing at the same time. Of course, you are going to make sure that uh, big deadlines are delivered in time. Deadlines are, of course, something that we all have to deal with. And you can't just not deliver a deadline because you decided that your team had to fix bugs. If something has to be done at a certain time, you have to make sure that everybody is done before or at that time. OK, so let's summarize everything I, I explained in this talk. So. You're going to want to write feature specs to cover your public APIs for your frameworks, applications, and SDKs, and make sure that these specs cover the public API and don't go into details on the private APIs. A feature spec should cover the what, the how, and the why without dictating any implementation details, unless it's business logic, of course, then it makes sense. I recommend to add Gherkin as a means of testing. Uh, this allows you to capture a minimum set of tests that every platform can implement, um, and it aids in a TDD approach towards development for every platform, not just the spec itself. During spec review, you want to make sure that you cross your T's and dot your I's um, and make sure that you get a review from every team member, because then you know that everybody can and will implement a feature correctly. 
And lastly, allow platforms to diverge and let them work at their own pace. Um, it's okay if features and version numbers are not identical for every single framework and every single platform, as long as deadlines are met. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And that's all from me. I'll see you in the QA. Thank you for that there, Donnie. Hopefully we took something beyond just caps and guitars and took something real useful for ourselves. Let us know what you thought there in that chat. Now we have one more speaker before the break, and that speaker is a master of information technologies working in Ars Futura as an Android developer with over five years of experience in software development. Their focus is on developing and optimizing native Android applications. Beyond that, in their free time, they enjoy nature and traveling and seeing new places. Let's introduce Dennis Fodor. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis, and I'm really honored to be presenting at Shift Remote Conference. I'm an Android engineer at Ars Futura, and today I'm going to talk about motion layout. So let's start with our topic. Uh, first, I'll give you a quick introduction and explain what motion layout is. Uh, after that, I'm going to show how to use motion layout. Next thing is to briefly explain motion scene file elements. Then uh, I'm going to show you sample animation and in the end uh, we have conclusion. As stated in documentation, uh, motion layout is a layout type that helps you manage motion and widget animation in your app. It is a subclass of constraint layout and builds upon its rich layout capabilities. Motion layout bridges the gap between layout transitions and complex motion handling, offering a mix of features between the property animation framework, transition manager and coordinator layout. It is really powerful, it has a lot of potential, but there are also some limitations that should be taken into consideration. Those limitations are it only works with its direct children, it does not support nested layout hierarchies, and it does not support activity transitions. On the other side, uh, here are some of the motion layout key features. Uh, with motion layout, uh, you can describe transitions between layouts, uh, you can animate layout properties. Motion layout uh, supports seekable transitions and keyframes for customized transitions. It is fully declarative and any of its transitions can be described in an XML file. It is also backwards compatible to API level 14. After introduction, it's time to show you how to use motion layout. Just wanted to mention here that at the time of creating sample animation that will be shown later, the latest version of constraint layout was 2.0.0 beta 4 but now there is for sure new version so feel free to find the latest version in official documentation so there are two ways to add uh, motion layout constraint layout dependency and if you're using android x then you'll add, you'll add android x dependency or you can add support dependency if you're not using android x here is our uh, motion layout. If you add motion layout to your layout file, uh, you'll notice error that layout description is missing. The easiest way to fix this is to use the shortcut for generating motion scene file or to simply click on generate motion scene button that you can see on the screenshot. After you did it, uh, you can see that error is gone and learning motion layout scene file is generated in XML folder inside your resources. So here we can see our generated uh, basic motion scene file. As you can see, motion scene is the root element and it contains two constraint sets and one transition element. In this part, I'm going to briefly explain previously mentioned motion scene elements. 
Uh, first one is motion scene. As we mentioned before, it is the root element of a motion scene file. Uh, it is used to create animations in a declarative way. The good thing here is that the same motion scene file can be reused and applied to different layouts. Next element is constraint set. Uh, it has definitions for each view you want to animate in a motion sequence. Then uh, we have constraint element. It specifies the attributes and position of a single view in a motion sequence. And in the end, uh, there is transition element. Uh, it contains at least the start and the end constraint set. It describes the changes from the start to the end state. And it can contain on click, on swipe, and keyframe set elements. Uh, the elements that I mentioned here are the basic ones, but you can find more info about others in official documentation. Next part is sample animation. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have a demo here and there's uh, also a link to the GitHub repository for those who want to check uh, complete source code. Uh, before we dive deeper into the animation implementation, I wanted to mention that this is a multi-step animation and the problem with motion layout is that, is that it currently does not have an API for controlled multi-step transitions. Uh, we have a pretty simple animation uh, which, has, which has four constraint sets and it handles uh, three transitions. If you are in a situation where you have more complex transitions uh, with more steps, you can check an article called Spending Over Views Example, written by Chris Baines, and see what's the other approach to this problem. Now we can start with our animation implementation. First, uh, we will check Activity Layout file. Here you can see a parent motion layout uh, with two children, Recycler View, and another motion layout containing views that will be animated. The purpose of the parent motion layout is to control the visibility of its children through a motion scene file. When the recycled view item is clicked, uh, we call the animate method that is defined in music band list activity. First, uh, we need to modify the margins of our views with values from the interface parameter. The animated view represents uh, the child motion layout containing all the views that will be animated. The first set, the second set and third set are IDs of the constraint sets. After that, we need to set data to animate views, set the transition listener, uh, start the parent animation to hide the recycler view and show the motion layout. The active set is a constraint set state type, uh, which is an enum that helps us tracking which constraint set is next or previous. And in the end, uh, this is how our transition adapter looks like. As you can see, it's pretty simple, because the only thing that we are doing here is checking the active state and then deciding which state should be active next. Here uh, you can see the result after first transition from first set to second set. Yeah, before uh, uh, explanation, uh, I wanted to say that I didn't want to copy all the XML from the motion scene file because uh, it's a lot of code and we don't have much time here. And I also think that that wouldn't be beneficial since you can always go to GitHub repository and see all constraint sets and transition. Yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, all constraint sets and transitions are defined in the animated music band items in file. In the first set, uh, we are positioning the views, uh, we are setting the thumbnail dimension ratio and scale, and we are hiding back arrow. In the second set, uh, we have to set the scale type again, so it would not be lost and we need to hide other views. When the first transition is done, we are immediately ready to start the second transition, so from the second set to the third set in the on transition completed callback that I've shown before. Here you can see the result after second transition from the second set to the third set. 
Yes, so our starting point here is second set and then in the third set we are making the views visible while controlling the situation when the animation will be executed from the end to the start state. Inside the transition block the onclick action is used to toggle between second set and third set. And finally here is a result after the third transition from the third set to the fourth set. The last step of the animation is completely defined in the motion sync file and there is no need to start it programmatically like we did in other states. In other states. Inside the transition block uh, we again have the onclick action which is used to toggle between third and fourth set. And we are also uh, using image filter view class from constraint layout uh, to animate image transition with its uh, crossfade attribute. And in the end conclusion, so this presentation provided some general information about motion layout and sample animation with all the pieces put together. So even though it motion layout is still in beta, that doesn't prevent us from creating beautiful animations uh, and playing with it. Here I uh, listed some references that helped me to dive uh, deeper into the motion layout animations. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at dennis at arsfutura.co. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dennis. And with that, that brings us to our break. We have about five minutes. Now, something to announce in this break. We are really, really proud to bring you the date for our next in-person conference taking place in Split, which will be on the 14th and 15th of September. If you haven't already blocked that date out in your calendar, please do and get in touch with us because we're looking forward to seeing you there in person. However, you have five minutes Grab yourself a coffee and we'll see you again soon. Um, I love coming to Shift every year. First of all, Croatia is beautiful. What's really nice about Shift as a development conference is that it really brings people from all walks of development um, and you don't really see that anymore. The vibe here is incredible. There's such a buzz everywhere. Uh, I think 1,200 people turned up. I'm looking forward to the rest of today. It's a whole other day of conference tomorrow. I'm often baffled by not how much I learn, but how I learn that I don't know yet. So I always go home from this sort of inspired, but also just very keen to just keep on reading up on stuff and learning what I evidently did not know. Welcome back after the break. If you can hear my voice, that means it's time to get back in front of the screen as we carry on with our Shift Remote Conference. I hope you managed to get some time outside or grab yourself a drink, and I hope you even more so managed to block that day out in your calendar for our in-person conference on the 14th and 15th of September in Split. However, moving on. Three more speakers to go. Our next one is currently working as an Android infrastructure engineer at Spotify, where they're responsible for building the audio experience for millions of Android users worldwide. 
They usually call themselves a community addict and can't survive without learning every day, sharing knowledge and having fun and just getting to know other developers. They're also currently managing the GDG chapter in Stockholm and the one in Pizza. When they're not doing that, they love open source photography and running. Let's welcome Nicola Corti. Hi everyone, thank you very much for coming to this talk. My name is Nicola Corti and today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about DevOpsify your life with GitHub Actions. So mandatory slide about myself. I work as Android infrastructure engineer at Spotify in Stockholm, Sweden. That's my Twitter handle. And by the way, the slides are already there. Like if you, if you go on my profile, you will find a pinned tweet with my slides over there. So that's already sorted out. And those are my obvious. So, and things that I, that I like to talk about and, and enjoy. Today, we're not gonna talk about something specifically related to Spotify, but rather something that I do in my, in my free time and my, like as part of my open source effort. We're gonna talk about continuous integration and continuous delivery. So I want to spend a couple of minutes introducing what continuous integration is. So continuous integration is a process. It's a high level process that I invite everyone that develops software to have integrated within your environment. It all starts with your code base. So you have your code version somewhere. I assume you have like uh, your code base and you have a branch. It's called master main. You call it as you want, but that's like, that's like your code base. And then you want to integrate a new change. So there is an event. Uh, started by a developer or someone else that wants to integrate a new change. So it opens like a pull request, a change request. There is this intention of adding new code. So to make sure that we don't break our current code base quality and, and status, we need to run this continuous integration process. So we need to, to verify the quality of this change that is going to be integrated. So there are some steps. The first step is we want to build the code base with this change. Building the, building the code base with this, with this new integration is already a form of test. So the first things that we want to make sure is that the code base compiles. Then obviously we have like probably a big suite of tests, JUnit tests, integration tests, whatsoever. But we want to make sure that the quality of our software uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't decrease. So we we will we will have some tests and we want to make sure that they run on every integration but we probably also have other tools like static analyzers tools that are able to inspect our code base and find out if we are probably making mistakes or introducing bugs and generally there is also like a human a human part in this process so there is like a code review someone else will read our code and will make sure that it's fine if everything is green, so if every part in this process agrees, then we can merge our, our code and we can go back to master. So this continuous integration loop can happen multiple times. You can uh, submit your first uh, pull request diff, then if uh, something is broken, you might submit another diff till everything is green. So I talked about continuous integration, but I want to spend also some minutes talking about continuous delivery. So continuous delivery is another process. And again, we can think about it as, as a loop also this time, but it has an, another purpose. The purpose is not to integrate new code, but the purpose here is to deliver software outside to the public. So we want to create a new release. We have master and we pick a certain state of our code base and we say that this is like a candidate. So this certain point in time is a good candidate to become a new release. And we have some steps. First, we want to create an artifact. Our code base can't just be distributed to our user as a group of files. For example, if you are on Android, you want to create an APK or an app bundle. If you are a node, you need to create an, a node package. So you will need to create a bundle that represents the current status of the code base. Then you will have other tests. Sometimes those tests are the same as the, as the continuous integration loop, 
but other times can be can be more uh, more detailed tests. For example, for an Android app, you might have an external Q and A team of humans that actually test your app, and you want them to test your app only when you want to create a new release, not on every pull request. And then you want to deploy. So you will have like your alpha users, your beta users. So you want to make sure that your release candidate is available to them. And again, this loop can happen multiple times. For once for the alpha, then again for the beta, beta one, beta two. And once everyone is ready and everyone agrees, all is green, we create actually a new release of our software. So really continuous integration and continuous delivery are the first processes that I set up in my in my environment whenever I start creating software. And they're they're really they're really important, they're really crucial because their fundamental role is to make sure that the quality of, of your software is high. We I don't want uh, people that send pull requests on my GitHub uh, projects to I don't want to ask them, hey, can you please run your test locally and post the output here? That would not be efficient. And also I will have to trust them. That doesn't work. So I want to have a system that runs this loop for me. That's why there are several CI and CD tools available out there. Some of them are free, uh, others are not free, others are on-premise. There are really a huge variety. And I've been using specifically Travis and Circle CI for a lot of open source projects of mine. But today we, we are here to talk about another type of uh, this uh, CI CD tool. We are here to talk about GitHub Actions. So GitHub Actions is, is a bit different than the other, specifically if you're doing a lot of open source on GitHub, because it's just there. Like it's highly integrated within GitHub. So you will find it available uh, in a tab on every repository that has uh, GitHub Actions enabled. The, it has a lot of nice feature. I think that probably one of the most important is that it's free for public repositories. That might sound obvious also because other tools like Travis and Circle are also free for uh, public repositories. But I think it's still like, it's definitely a plus and that made me migrate a lot of uh, repo to GitHub Actions because of this, and also because I can use it also for my private repository. I, uh, there is like a limit of 2000 minutes per month that are included. So if you build, if your build time is below that, that amount, you, you will not have to pay anything to GitHub Actions. Another, another thing that I really like is that oops, there are already 4,000 plus available actions developed by other developers. They're available to use and they can be composed to achieve what you need. And we will see how in the following slides. Then another, I think, killer feature of GitHub Actions is that you can actually test your, uh, your software on different platforms, specifically Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, free of charge. Like you will have workers for every platform and you will not have to do any extra setup. It's really, it's really trivial and it works just great. So in the past, I used to use different CI system, like one for Windows and one for Linux. And sometimes one of the two just broke for whatever reason. So having everything collected in the same CI tools definitely reduces the maintenance cost. And also for, for me, like I'm an Android engineer, so I'm mostly focused on Android projects. You can, uh, you, you can check on, on the GitHub documentations with which kind of packages are already available on the, on the worker. So for example, in the, in the Ubuntu 18.04, you would see that there are like some basic packages that are like, uh, useful, but what is most important is that all the Android SDK is already installed and available there for you. So I really, I really don't remember how many times my CI failed because the Android licenses were like not accepted. So here everything is installed and ready and set up for you. So you can just start building immediately. That's really convenient. So let's deep dive a little bit on how the configuration uh, file and setup of GitHub Actions looks like. It all starts with workflows. What are workflows? So to explain them, 
we can just think as a workflow as as a, a YAML file. So you can you can have one that represents your build, or you can have multiples, like one for the build, one for the release, and one for a, like a cleanup. To understand uh, workflows, we need to also introduce the concept of triggers. So what are triggers? Triggers are events that starts one or more workflow. So for example, I can say that when I open a pull request that is actually a trigger, the build workflow should start. So whenever uh, there is a pull request, um, the build should run. Then I can say that whenever I push to a certain branch, also in that occasion, the, builds, the build should run. And I can have like a release branch. And when I push on the release branch, the release workflow should start. Then there are also other triggers that are uh, a bit different. For example, I can say that on comment, like whenever there is a comment event, so someone is commenting on an issue or on a pull request, a uh, cleanup workflow should start. So I can say that when someone writes slash close, the issue should be closed. Or I can have a schedule event, so like a cron job that every day at midnight closes my older issue or my inactive pull requests. Every workflow inside can have one or more job. So if there is just one job, it will run from the beginning till the end. But if there are more jobs, for example, in the release workflow, I can have a Gradle job that will just build something. And then I can have two upload jobs, upload to bean tray and upload to Sonotype, for example, for a library. Those jobs can either run in parallel or I can define dependencies. So I can say that Gra Gradle starts first and then the two uploads should start, or they can just all run in parallel. This will uh, deeply reduce the total time that MyCI takes to run a workflow. So let's see one example. So we said that those are like YAML file. And now I want to walk you through one YAML file, one simple YAML file to see how it looks like. So the first thing that we need to define is the name. So in this case, we just call it build because we want to run a build on every, like for example, pull request. So here we have the, the branches, uh, we have the triggers. So in this case, we are saying that this will run on push to every branches. And we also run on pull request on every branches. So whenever I just push a branch or someone opens a pull request, this whole workflow will run. Then it's up to the job. So we define a job and we call it Gradle. I usually call them Gradle because they run Gradle work inside, but you can call it as you wish. You can call it uh, build, test, whatsoever. So here we define where we want our job to run. In this case, we want to run it on Ubuntu. And we define the steps. So the list of steps that should run. In this case, the first step is check out the repo. So we want to check out the source code. So inside the runner, we want to copy the, our, the, the latest branch. And, and then we want to build everything. So let's focus one second here. Uh, there are two steps here. One is defined with run, and the other is defined with uses. So first, the one that is defined with run, that's basically a bash command. So we say run and do this. In this case, I want to just assemble and that will assemble everything. This one instead, the other one they, that it's defined with uses, that it's basically using another GitHub actions. So it's using the, the like a building block of someone else. In this case, the one like, like you see, this is actions slash checkout. So, if you go on github.com slash actions slash checkout, you will find a repository that is actually containing these custom actions. And, and you will see what is, what is running. This at v2 syntax means that we are using version number two of that specific action. And last thing is that we are using a first party action because this contains actions in the name. So this is provided by GitHub and we can be sure that it's going to be maintained and will work fine. So now to be a little bit more concrete, I want to walk you through some projects 
two projects that, that, are, that I worked on recently and that I migrated from other CIs to GitHub Actions. Those are, those are open source and available on GitHub, so you can go there. The first one is uh, github.com slash apintro slash apintro. It's basically a library to create uh, introductions for Android apps. It used to use Travis, and now we migrated it to use GitHub Actions. So let's see how the GitHub Action file looks like. So that's it. It's, I mean, that's like a fragment, but if you go on the repo and you search for the workflow file, you will see that it's really, really uh, small. So there is one job, it's called Gradle, uh, and it has four steps. So checking out the repo, running ktlint, running detect, and then running all the tests. That's it. So actually, I'm lying here because we did some refactoring uh, recently, and we improved a bit. So the problem here is that this Gradle job is running four things one after the other, and they run in parallel. So for example, the tests will not start to run before detect and ktlint are actually finished. And those three jobs are completely independent. They could run in parallel. So that's why we actually created three separate jobs. So there is one job called ktlint, one called detect, and one called tests. And that's really convenient also because when people open pull requests on your repository, they will see three separate jobs with the status and they will see, hey, it failed on ktlint, but it passed the tests. So I have a formatting problem. And so if you, if you see how our run of our GitHub Actions looks like, it's something like that. There is like a lot of check marks uh, with the status of every single job. Uh, so ktlint detect and test. Specifically, there is also another job that is build debug APK here. And you'll see that it creates uh, an artifact here on the right. It's called a Pintro sample app.apk. This is another convenient job that you can add. And it's really also, this one is really trivial. This allows you to have like a debug APK ready uh, on every pull request that you can just uh, download and install on your device. And how it looks like really similar to the other. So we have a build debug APK. We invoke the assemble debug that will run, they will actually create our APK. And then we call this other uh, action. This is again, a first party action. It's called actions upload artifact, artifact. And it requires two parameters, the name and the, and the path. So the name will be a pin through sample app.apk. And here we have the, the full path of where the artifact will be. So now I want to talk about another project. So detect. So detect is a bigger project and is a static analyzer for Kotlin. So recently I spent some time migrating it. It used to use a mix of two CIs, so both Travis and AppVayor, and we migrated everything over to, to GitHub Actions. And there are some interesting parts. I invite you to take a look at that workflow file because it's rather complicated. But there is a lot to learn. Today, I will show you some, some fragments. So inside the job, there is one called Gradle. And this one has an if at the beginning. So this if at the beginning allows us to define a condition that, if, uh, that will eventually skip the, the run. So in this case, we want to run it if it doesn't contain in the head commit message, the CI skip. So these allow you to basically write a commit message that contains CI skip. For example, if you're um, updating the readme, that would be Andy. You don't need to wait for the CI uh, to, to merge your, your, your pull request. And then here, there is um, a really interesting feature of GitHub Actions. There is uh, a, build, a build matrix. So uh, inside strategy, we define a matrix object with several keys. Uh, so we have one key and is OS and contains Ubuntu latest, macOS latest, and Windows latest. And then we have JDK that contains 8, 11, 14. So these allow us basically to have uh, a matrix of all the possible combinations. So we will have in total nine job that run 
And those two keys, OS and JDK, will contain the value of uh, like the, the combination of every single job. So for example, here we are saying that it runs on matrix.os. So the specific job will run on, on, the, on the instance that is provided by this key. And then we have, we set some environment variable. Here we set two environment variables. The first one is, is a static one. It's just a string is, is a Gradle configuration. And the second one instead is, is a variable called JDK version. And JDK version is populated using matrix.jdk. So we use the entry of this key to uh, populate this environment variable. And so that will that environment variable is used later in the build. But uh, here we also use this action to set up Java because we want Java to be at a specific version, the one that is provided by the matrix. And again, we use an action from uh, GitHub action. So a first party one called setup Java, and we pass the Java version that we're interested in this case, uh, 8, 11, or 14. So then if you open a pull request on detect, you will see something like that. So uh, like here we see that we have pretty much checks, a job called Gradle, and this is the instance macOS latest 8. So this is Java 8 and macOS latest. And we are able to test our tool on every platform and on the major Java versions. This is really convenient because it allows us to already exclude a lot of problems when users are coming and say like, hey, I'm on Windows and I'm not able to run your tool because we are developing on Mac or Linux. So we focused a lot on continuous um, integration. So a lot of uh, the examples I presented were like about running tests or uh, integrating pull requests. Now I want to show you um, a little part of continuous uh, deployment. So how we can actually ship an app to production using GitHub Actions. Again, we have a YAML file. So we set the name, release the Play Store. And in this case, we say that this should run only on push to are a specific branch, like the release branch. And then again, we define, define the steps. The steps that we have in this case are, are trivial. Again, we do the checkout. So we check out the code and then we want to create an app bundle, a release app bundle. So we're not interested in our debug APK anymore. We shift our focus a bit and we invoke this command called bundle release. So then we need to sign our, our app bundle. How do we do it? So in this case, we use this uh, third party app action. So you see that this is from a road kill and it's called sign Android release v1. This is not provided by GitHub, but it's provided by another developer. So if you want to see what's going on, you can actually check inside the, the action and, and verify that uh, everything is working fine. And it requires some parameters, for example, uh, where is the release directory and the alias and the key store password, et cetera, et cetera. So all the things that are needed in order to sign your app bundle. And then the last step is actually uploading on the Play Store. So again, we use another, another third party action, uh, still from Roadkill, upload Google Play. And it requires, uh, some some informations like where is the release file and on which track it should be uploaded like internal beta alpha and that's it so that's like the yaml file that will actually allow you to ship your app to the play store it's really it's really small it's 40 lines and it's really easy to maintain way better than a lot of other files i had to deal with and um, ci configurations in the past i really invite you to take a look because uh, it's really well integrated inside GitHub Actions, inside GitHub, and it's really a pleasure also for people that contribute to your repo because they see that everything is integrated and it works really great. So with that, that's that's all for me for today. Um, happy DevOpsifying. If 
uh, again, the slides are on Twitter slash Cortinico. Um, and if you go on my website, there is mcorti.com, you will find a lot of uh, material also related to, to GitHub Actions. So thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, Nicola. And let's hope that you all took something from that. Let us know as always in that chat. I say that a lot and I mean it because we love to hear from you. Now our next speaker is a master in iOS. They've also worked though on Android and Flutter and a few back-end and front-end technologies. But in the last few years, they've got more into architecture, planning, organization, and mentoring. And they now lead a mobile de department inside Q Company. Let's welcome Zlatko Matokanovic. Hi, uh, my name is Zlatko Matokanovic. Uh, I work at uh, Q Agency as a mobile team lead. Uh, primarily, my uh, technology is iOS, which I work uh, for about uh, 10 years now. Uh, lately, uh, I've been uh, playing with Flutter. All, all my team was uh, developing a few projects in Flutter, so we uh, came to our little solution about uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery concerning the Flutter projects. In this 20-minute uh, presentation, I will try not to be too broad, but also not to go too much into detail. Uh, first, I will talk about uh, Flutter a bit, just uh, for people who are not familiar with it, then uh, about the uh, concept of continuous integration and continuous delivery, talk a bit about environments, flavors, and uh, about the tool that we will use uh, in, the, in our case, it will be a bit rise. So uh, let's uh, start. Okay, so what is Flutter? Uh, Flutter is uh, Google's pretty new uh, UI toolkit. Uh, it allows us to work on one code base and uh, natively compile applications for mobile, web, desktop, uh, and even embedded systems uh, from one uh, code base. Uh, it's written in Dart language, and the engine uh, itself is written in C++. Uh, you probably already know that there is a lot of uh, hybrid solutions on the market. Uh, for example, React Native, Ionic, Xamarin, and so on. So why is Flutter so special? I mean, to be frank, it's not real special. It's uh, every hybrid solution has its uh, ups and downs, uh, but most of them share the same good points and same bad points when compared to native development. So why Flutter? Uh, it has a pretty good rendering performance. Uh, it's exciting, it's very new. It's developed uh, by Google, so it's very good documented. And uh, in a more strategic, Point uh, uh, Fushia is an open source uh, operating system developed by Google. Uh, it's pretty, it's a pretty good state right now, uh, and uh, its user user interface and apps are written in Flutter. So in a in many maybe near future, it will maybe even uh, be used instead of Android, or at least in coexisting with Android. So in both cases. Uh, Flutter would be a pretty good choice to be uh, good at because uh, everything about that operate, operating system will be written in Flutter. Okay, now let's talk a bit about uh, continuous integration and uh, uh, not deployment but uh, del delivering, continuous integration and delivering uh, concept in a theory. So merging all developers working copies to a shared mainline. What does that mean? Uh, by working copies, I mean, a, of course, uh, source code. And by shared mainline, I, I mean a code base on some source repository. For example, we will use a GitLab. Uh, it allows us for a uh, faster development cycle. Uh, it gives us opportunity to fix bugs very quickly. And uh, for an agile company like a Q Agency, it's a must-have approach. Uh, it speeds up the development process, as you can see in this uh, little image where it uh, goes it goes right in the middle between development and distribution of the applications uh, these are a few of the steps which uh, not all of them have, have to be involved but uh, 
in most cases they are. So first you he have to get uh, access to the source code control, GitLab in our case. Uh, then uh, we run a static analysis on the code, uh, compile and build the app, run automatic tests. And if any of those uh, steps fail, we are notified with an error email or some other kind of notification. If that happens, then team uh, fixes the bugs and restarts the flow by pushing a new code. In the real world, uh, this is mostly done when we uh, create a new feature and add it to our development branch from a feature group of branches. So whenever we make a pull request, this cycle is started. When the cycle is over, then we go to the next step, which is uh, delivery. Uh, delivery uh, pretty much just adds, adds uh, extra steps to the previous one, to the continuous integration. As I said, it, we, have, we need to have it in an agile environment because it allows us to produce software in a very short cycle and in a very short, uh, quick iterations. So whenever a customer changes something or adds something, removes, we need to be able to be quick, be streamlined, uh, and uh, to do not think that changes in those cycles is just the code. So everything connected with the delivery process is always the same. So we don't have to worry about it. And whenever the cycle starts, uh, for delivery, we can do other things. So we can, we don't have to lose time on, on delivering a product every, every two or three days because it really adds up and it opens uh, possibilities for a lot of uh, problems. Uh, steps that are involved in delivery uh, basically come, come, to, come to this. Uh, it's packaging application. So it's uh, creating a binary from the code. So for Android, it's a APK. APK. For uh, iOS, it's a IPA or APP uh, file. Uh, those files are then called signed. For iOS, certificates, uh, Apple certificates and provisioning. For Android, it's a key store file and the uh, information uh, connected with it. Then we deploy to first testing and then production. Uh, for production, we are using, of course, App Store and Google Play. For testing, uh, we are using Test Flight and Google Play Bit. Uh, this little uh, image uh, shows a pretty simple way uh, in how those two processes uh, coexist one with each other. As you can see, uh, continuous integration and delivery are both uh, cycles. Okay, let's talk about environments. Uh, one of the reasons, one of, one of the reasons why uh, I like CICD concept is uh, because it really uh, simplifies the use of uh, a lot of environments. In this case, uh, we are using development, staging, and production. Uh, development, of course, uh, uses development backend, development uh, name of the app, uh, we add another, uh, suffixes to it, we, we may change features for it. But uh, well, while we are in development, back, uh, environment it's pretty volatile so uh, it's pretty it's pretty much always under construction so there's rarely uh, a safe place uh, for code so there's there is no stable code until we finish a feature that we're working on after that we go to staging which is much much more stable and uh, while we are, while we are at staging environment we push the app for testing for our QA team or for customer if we want after uh, we when uh, we go to staging, of course, whenever we add something measurable to the app, that's, uh, for example, another feature, or we remove something. Uh, after staging is done, so we get a clean working solution, we go to production where we one uh, last time do the testing on production environment just to see if everything fits. If everything is okay, we go live uh, on stores, which are, of course, connected to production environment. Uh, flavors. <coughs> are a way for uh, our code to find out on which environment we want to build it and on which environment it needs to run. As I said, uh, we don't just have to uh, put base URL as our uh, environment variables. We can use different features for app, uh, different icons, uh, app names, uh, different tenants, even different customers for the same app. Uh, basically differentiates configuration between environments. Uh, it's different for all 
technologies. For example, Android uses product flavors, iOS uses uh, iOS schemas, and Dart uh, language, uh, we use multiple app entries. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty straightforward to add uh, product flavors. Uh, this is added as a chunk of a config to uh, app uh, build Gradle. So as you can see, uh, we have dev, staging, and prod environments, or flavors in this case. Uh, uh, we are only changing the suffix that we add to the application ID and version name. This way, we always know which app we have in our hands uh, and uh, at which environment it looks. You can, of course, add a lot of different uh, different things for uh, every environment in which way you can uh, differentiate the apps. So it's pretty simple to add it to, to config file. For iOS, it's a, a bit more uh, complex because uh, there's a, a few ways to do it. Uh, we chose, uh, I think, the most streamlined way where we use just one target for building and we use multiple configs and multiple uh, schemas. Every schema, in this case, staging, development, and production looks as uh, looks at its uh, config counterpart. As, as you can see, we have dev, staging, and prod config files. In this case, we are looking at staging. Uh, and on the right side, you see where we uh, set up a Flutter target. So it looks at the main staging uh, entry point to the app. And uh, we even change the bundle ID for this uh, environment, for this config. And for that flavor, so there is no uh, straightforward way to do it. Uh, there is no built-in way to differentiate the flavors. So we declare three different uh, app entries. For the, by default, uh, main, uh, main dot dart is the uh, main. <laughs> it's the entry for the app. But uh, you can uh, change it uh, if you want while running the, the build process. So you, as you can see, we added uh, three different uh, classes, three different widgets in Flutter. Main dev, main staging, and main prod. On the bottom uh, of the screen, you can see the, in the way we uh, run this uh, build from Flutter command line. You see that we are telling it to use the flavor development and that it should start with the main dev file. Main dev file should be starting for point from for this app, and then we can change uh, whatever we want for that uh, flavor. For example, base URL and so on. The most important thing is that app at the runtime knows what to do and knows in which environment it is. OK, so we covered uh, a bit uh, of uh, theoretical part of this uh, presentation. Uh, just not to stay, not to just uh, speak theoretically, we had to choose one uh, tool in which we can show how this everything works. Uh, we chose Bitrise uh, not because I mean it's the best and it's the only one. Uh, on the contrary, there's there's a ton of other tools that we can use. Uh, as you can see there's Jenkins, Team City, BuildKite, and so on, and, and so on. Uh, some of them are self-hosted, some of them are cloud. Bitrise is both. Uh, we are using the cloud solution. Uh, it's mobile oriented, uh, has a free plan, which is convenient for everyone. Uh, UI is good for presentation. It's a lot, it's very visual. So it's good to show uh, steps and workflows. And the Flutter is very well covered, very well covered in uh, its uh, steps. Uh, first, of course, uh, we need to add a project to it. Uh, first uh, step, connect to Git location, in our case, GitLab. It has a pretty good, uh, a little wizard, which uh, if you are you set up your project good and correctly, it will auto detect what kind of project it is, be it uh, Flutter, iOS, Android, uh, React Native, Ionic, and so on. And it uh, gives you a small default workflow, which you can use, extend, or delete and use your own. In our case, we are using our, our own uh, workflows. Uh, we connect to Apple portal the certificates, provisioning, everything that's needed for uh, for us to code sign the app, iOS and Android. Good thing about Bitrise, it, uh, it, uses, it uses environment variables. It can be set up per workflow. So basically, we can use the same workflow and uh, just change the variables depending on the flavor or environment that we want to use, which is great uh, when uh, we just need to add another app to our uh, CI CD procedure. 
uh, workflow consists of steps. Uh, steps are perform, uh, performed one after another. One of steps can be, for example, Flutter build, which we will use. Uh, others can be various uh, webhooks like Slack, uh, GitLab, Bit, uh, Bitbucket. Uh, a lot of uh, different notifications can be done via these steps, uh, connections with Git, and so on. So steps are very uh, versatile and uh, they're open source, so you can you can add your own step. They're very very well documented, and there are a number of uh, pretty much default steps that everyone uses for the most. Uh, important uh, things like building and distribution. It can be added by drag and drop, a very nice UI as you will see, or bitrise config file. Both of those are reflected one on another. So when you change something with the UI part, its counterpart, the bitrise uh, config file is also changed. So it, it's great for backupping and uh, copy pasting the config file to another project and that just changing the variables. Uh, we will use uh, five workflows in our presentation. Of course, uh, you can add whatever you want. This is the way we do it for now. Uh, so let's go through them. First one is pull request. This one uh, technically is just a continuous integration because it does not uh, push anything out. So it does not do the delivery part. It's connected to development branch. Uh, it's triggered on pull requests to the development branch from any other branch. Mostly it's a feature branch. Uh, What's important is that it simulates merged code and gives feedback about success. Uh, so it checks code quality, test uh, coverage, and build status for the simulated merge. Uh, if everything is OK, we are informed via email or via pipeline in a notification on GitLab. We are informed that everything went well. And then we can uh, do the merge ourselves with uh, by hand, because there is still a need of, for human contact there. Uh, after that is done, uh, then uh, we can, I mean, that's it for that uh, pull request workflow. We don't do any delivery. On bottom, you can see home commands, how they look. Basically, we, we just use uh, for iOS and for Android, we choose flavor development and choose flavor uh, development entry point. This is the how it looks on Bitrise tool. On the left side, there is a list of uh, steps on the workflow. Workflow is pull request, of course. Uh, first, we go from top to bottom. First, we activate SSH keys, which we put in the settings of the Bitrise tool. Uh, then we, next step, uh, clones the repository, uh, copies the code, uh, installs the certifi certificates and profile provisionings that's needed for uh, iPhone, for iOS build later. Uh, then we go with the most important part, it's the Flutter install. It's always blank, so it's always a clean slate. That's why it's sometimes a bit uh, slow, because they don't use cache, which is good and bad, uh, because bad is because it's slower, good because less errors. Uh, then we go with the Flutter analyze, Flutter build, Flutter test, and if everything is okay, we inform via GitLab uh, webhook that uh, everything is uh, good. If any of those steps fail, we are informed that uh, there is an error and uh, then we need to look what, what the problem is. In the Flutter build uh, step, we are using a variable, environmental variable, which is changed depending on the, on the workflow. So in this case, we are using the command that I talked about a slide before. We put it in the environmental variable and then add it to this step so it knows what to run. Uh, next two workflows uh, are used for the delivery part. Uh, it's they are triggered if we push a branch with the name iOS release staging and uh, this uh, version number and build number. It needs to be in this format. Of course, you change uh, wildcards with uh, your numbers. Uh, well, uh, it looks a bit complicated, but uh, when you get used to it, it's pretty simple. And I think it uh, encourages a good uh, naming system and uh, it pretty much says about the build everything you need to know on the branch name itself and it's a good way to differentiate uh, android and ios we differentiate th those workflows because uh, first it gives us more flexibility uh, if for any reason we just want to push ios build we can do it uh, just by calling its branch uh, 
And uh, for Bitrise, we have a plan that gives us uh, two parallel builds. So at the same time, we build both uh, small workflows, which is faster than building one long one. Yeah. Uh, of course, you, we are using flavor staging here. We are using staging environment. This is done when we send builds for QA testing. After everything is OK, we upload to Google, play beta, and test slide for uh, testing. The, uh, on the bottom, you can see a bit modified command. It uses a uh, flavor staging and uses the release argument because we are delivering. And we are using the uh, entry point main staging dart for both uh, platforms. This is what, how it looks like on Bitrise. Uh, it's a bit, uh, we just added a few more steps. Uh, we added the Xcode archive part, which creates the, AP, the uh, binary for the iOS. And we deploy it to iTunes Connect. Uh, after that, if everything is OK, we get a Slack message to our channel, which tells us, OK, QA, you can go and test this. That was for iOS. For Android, we have a, a bit different uh, steps, but the, the procedure is pretty much the same. Uh, first, we download Keystore file, install everything that Android needs. Uh, after Flutter is done with its part and testing, we do the Android sign and deploy to Google Play. After that, uh, again, we get the information on the Slack channel that uh, we can start testing. If anything fails here, we get an email about it with a pretty uh, verbose uh, log. So it, it's, it's good for uh, figuring out what went wrong. Uh, next uh, two are uh, pretty much the same. The only difference is the naming uh, scheme. It uses the release. Uh, using a uh, flavor production and uh, everything is the same except that it uses the production environment. Uh, this is a uh, part uh, where we define our triggers in Bitrise. As you can see on the left side, these are the push branch triggers with their names. And on the right side is their respective uh, work, uh, workflow that is being triggered. On the bottom, we have a pull request part where, uh, as you can see on the left side, we, we can choose source branch and target branch. In our case, we put a wild card in source branch because we don't really care where uh, the pull request comes. It's important that it comes to development part, development uh, branch. And then it uh, triggers the workflow uh, pull request. This is its counterpart in the config file. As you can see, it's very simple. Uh, it's simple to copy paste around your projects. And the uh, final thoughts, uh, I think uh, Flutter and CICD is pretty much a great, pretty, pretty great uh, match. Um, Flutter, Flutter on one side uh, has one code base, uh, one test or mi minor tweaks between platforms, promising future because of Google and uh, it's quick for prototyping. CICD speeds up the whole cycle and uh, simplifies the distribution, which is important for Flutter because we by nature have two platforms or more. Uh, so it's, it's streamlined, uh, easy to copy to another, another project because of the tools that we use, for example, Bitrise. And it bridges the care gap between programmers and DevOps. So basically, non-programmers can, can use workflows whenever they see fit. And uh, that's about it. Uh, th thank you uh, for your uh, viewing and uh, ask uh, any questions that you want on the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Zlatko. And with that, that brings us to our final speaker of this Shift Remote, who's an iOS engineer currently working at Infinuum with experience in developing large scale applications for diverse domestic and international clients when they're not speaking at conferences or writing articles, uh, given that life's not always about tech, right? They are also a fan of various sports and living a healthy lifestyle. Let's introduce Goran Berlas. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Goran and I'm an iOS engineer working at Infin. Today I'm going to be talking about SwiftUI and the declarative future that it's ushering in. And this is coming from a perspective of someone used to working in medium-sized teams on large-scale client projects. So your mileage may vary, however, hopefully everyone here will find something of interest in this talk. 
Okay, to begin, we need to cover uh, we need to cover how CFTI actually started. And everything really started out about a year ago when Apple first released it at WWDC uh, 2019 and with it brought some big claims. So firstly, they said that we are going to write less code. Stuff that previously took a lot of boring or boilerplate code would be things of the past. Secondly, came adaptability. So there are multiple types of it that we needed to consider. So platform adaptability, our apps would behave as first-class citizens on iOS, iPadOS, macOS, you name it. And after that came environment adaptability, so to light and dark mode, font scaling, uh, other accessibility features such as high contrast, etc. Life preview meant that we would no longer need to rebuild our applications, but our uh, changes would just appear instantaneously uh, in the preview. Single point of truth meant that we would have no more storyboard zips or code dancing to find out where our bug lies because things can overwrite each other. We would have just one single point of truth and that would be our code. And finally, there's the new declarative paradigm that I'm going to focus on in just a moment. And all of this uh, was meant to make SwiftUI really great. And Apple package, packaged it up with a nice little bow and told us, here you go, play around with it. And as developers, when we are presented with a shiny new toy, we do just that. We start to play around with it. It didn't really take long until we started seeing articles like this. So is SwiftUI the end of Objective-C? Is it the end of UI kit? Is it the end of the world? However, uh, it was neither of those. Uh, so SwiftUI, at least at its beginnings, uh, was kind of buggy. So preview was crashing, navigation was not working properly all the time. Uh, there were some undocumented features, for example, that stacks can have a maximum of 10, 10 elements. Uh, things that we were used to in the UI kit or app kit world were missing. So, for example, search bar, collection view, uh, tab navigation was not working as we as expected. Uh, there was no handling of the keyboard and stuff like that. So, things that uh, we were either used to or were expecting to happen didn't. And this raised the question, is CFTI really production ready? And for some minor applications, the well, the answer was, yeah, it's good enough, we can use it. But for uh, large-scale applications, uh, most of us uh, had a resounding no as the answer to that question. However, all of this brought us to the point uh, of thinking about state management and thinking about it in kind of a different way. So state management really is hard. And let's take a look, for example, at this screen. So this is Apple's mail and it has a list of data which is driven by some models and as well as some extra navigation and sorting steps. And in order to make a screen like this, we need to um, have all these elements. So we need to have our view controllers, we need to have our table view, we need to have our table view cells, our models, and also uh, a way to handle our navigation bar items. And in order to make this work, we need to connect all those things. And each line you can see here is a dependency. So Whenever our model changes, our UI needs to change. If the user presses the tab bar item, it can change uh, our models, etc. So in order to make everything work as the users expect, we need to uh, take care of all this state management. And this is just for one single screen. And our application has multiple screens, which could also depend on the same data. So the change on one screen uh, could mean that the other three screens need to update as well. And this brings me back to my previous point, that's, see, that state management really is hard. And building large-scale applications is hard. So today, applications uh, come with features that were unimaginable like seven or eight years ago. So, for example, multiplayer mode. Um, Apple Pages or Numbers needs to support multiple people editing uh, the document at the same time. We need to support multiple device sizes as I said, like in dark mode, accessibility. And we work in larger development teams as a result of that, where each contributor comes with a different set of skills. Uh, and these skills need to be aligned in order to make a cohesive app. Uh, all of this brings me to something that can be described as a science soundstage problem, where sure, it's easy to put a custom button on a screen, uh, but how easy is it uh, to make it respond well to accessibility? light and dark mode, 
Okay, we made it for our bottom, but how about the list of items? Now we need to make that list filterable. We need to make it work for that one customer uh, which has 10,000 items in this list. And we built a UI that looks good and works great, but it works uh, that way in the configuration that we used to create it. It can break for some users which have some specific parameters. And in the end, this can be really infuriating for the customers because the end app ends up feeling cheap or untrustworthy based on who built the UI and how much skill they had. So in the end, UI is all the customer sees. And if it sucks, it doesn't matter uh, how good your backend was or the foundational engineering work. And with Swift UI, we don't need to really worry about it, uh, worry about how our application is going to transition between all these states. We just need to describe them. So the age-old problem of uh, how to animate our updates to the screen based on some diffs is gone. So we just need to describe uh, how our UI should look like in a specific state, and Swift UI takes care of the rest for us. So to see how it works, uh, this, uh, this image shows all the basic building blocks of Swift UI. So we have our actions, we have our state, and we have our views. So views are what are rendered on the screen. States uh, define how our views are rendered. And actions, which can be either user actions, for example, user tapping or dragging some items, uh, some external event, for example, notifications. Uh, so those are combined into actions. Actions update the state, and the state updates the UI. The actions cannot update the state directly. There's no line there. And this unidirectional flow allows us to keep our uh, state management uh, really concise and work work seamlessly. So that's how SwiftUI aims to solve the problem of state management and paving the way forward at this year's WWDC. Uh, SwiftUI has received some much needed improvements and missing features. For example, lazy, uh, lazy stacks or lazy grids, which allow us to load elements when we need them to save our memory. We got ourselves some new UI uh, elements and options. As I said, grids, which allow us to create screens like this. We got magic geometry effect, which allows us to create uh, animations uh, like this, which would usually take us a day or two in the UI kit world. We got a lot of new property wrappers for our state management. And one of those which I like to single out is this uh, main property wrapper, uh, because it allows us actually to create a, an application fully in SwiftUI. Previously, this was not possible because we had to use app delegates or sync delegates, uh, but now this set main is a single point of entry uh, into our application. All of this to say that SwiftUI is not uh, just an alternative. So Apple has already started pushing it uh, to the spotlight by making it the only way to create uh, widgets. Uh, as well as on the macOS side, they also started using it prominently there, like in the new notification center. So if we take a look at this graphic created by Dario Rubik, uh, we can see that SwiftUI really is the only UI framework for Apple platforms that allow us to uh, build for all, all of them. And with the unification that Apple is pushing for in their design languages, and the fact that uh, from macOS Big Sur, iOS and iPad applications uh, can be run on it, uh, it all brings us to the point that SwiftUI really is not just an alternative, it is the future of development on Apple platforms. So it's not going to change uh, this year, it's not going to change in the next two years, but we can be sure that in a couple of years, uh, SwiftUI really will be the way to go when developing for Apple platforms, and we need to be ready for it. Uh, this, this has been it from me. I hope you all enjoyed the talk. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below, and hopefully I'll see some of you uh, in some other conference, hopefully, in person. Take care guys, see you later. Thank you Goran and with that once again that brings us to the end of another Shift Remote. I hope you've had fun, I hope you've taken something incredible from this 
And from us here at Shift, all that's left to be said is hashtag us on the social medias at hashtag Shift Remote. Remember, our in-person conference is taking place on the 14th and 15th of September over in Split. So if you haven't already, please do block those days out in your calendar. We would love to see you there. And once again, a huge thanks to our sponsors and partners at Microsoft, InfoBip, Autodesk, Microblink, Barrage, Azure Idea, ICT, Japania, Venture, Pseudocode 5, Ars Futura, Nanobit, Infinium, Q, Nine Dots, Get By Bus, Aspira, Code Anywhere, Pluggy, and Netokraja. Thank you so much. This would not have been possible without you. A huge thank you to you, our incredible listeners, for sticking with us. And once again, a huge thank you to Ivan and all the team behind the scenes here at Shift Conference. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.